Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z Podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. Byron is a biography of the famous poet Lord Byron, written by John Nicoll. The book provides a detailed and comprehensive account of Byron's life, including his childhood, education, travels, romantic relationships, literary career, and political activism. Nickel portrays Byron as a complex and fascinating figure with a strong personality and a talent for self-expression. He explores Byron's relationships with his parents, his lovers, and his friends, and provides insights into his literary works, including his poems and plays. The biography also delves into the political and social context of Byron's time, including the Romantic Movement, the Napoleonic Wars, and the struggles for national independence in Greece and Italy. Nicol examines how these events influenced Byron's ideas and actions, and how he used his celebrity status to promote his beliefs and ideals. If you enjoy our program, please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 2 Early Years and School Life Soon after the birth of her son, Mrs. Byron took him to Scotland. After spending some time with a relation, she early in 1790, settled in a small house at Aberdeen. Ere long her husband, who had in the interval dissipated away his remaining means, rejoined her, and they lived together in humble lodgings until their tempers, alike fiery and irritable, compelled a definite separation. They occupied apartments, for some time, at the opposite ends of the same street, and interchanged visits. Being accustomed to meet the boy and his nurse, the father expressed a wish that the former should be sent to live with him, at least for some days. To this request, Moore informs us, Mrs. Byron was at first not very willing to accede, but on the representation of the nurse that if he kept him over one night he would not do so another, she consented. On inquiring next morning after the child, she was told by Captain Byron that he had had quite enough of his young visitor. After a short stay in the north, the captain, extorting enough money from his wife to enable him to fly from his creditors, escaped to France. His absence must have been a relief, but his death is said to have so affected the unhappy lady that her shrieks disturbed the neighborhood. The circumstance recalls an anecdote of a similar outburst attested by Sir W. Scott, who was present on the occasion before her marriage. Being present at a representation in Edinburgh of the fatal marriage, when Mrs. Siddons was personating Isabella, Miss Gordon was seized with a fit and carried out of the theater, screaming out, Oh my Byron, my Byron. All we know of her character shows it to have been not only proud, impulsive and wayward, but hysterical. She constantly boasted of her descent and clung to the courtesy title of honorable to which she had no claim. Her affection and anger were alike demonstrative, her temper never for an hour secure. She half worshiped, half hated the blackguard to whom she was married and took no steps to protect her property her son she alternately petted and abused. Your mother's a fool, said a school companion to him years after. I know it, was his unique and tragic reply. Never was poet born to so much illustrious and to so much bad blood. The records of his infancy betray the temper which he preserved through life passionate, sullen, defiant of authority, but singularly amenable to kindness. 
on being scolded by his first nurse for having soiled a dress. Without uttering a word, he tore it from top to seam, as he had seen his mother tear her caps and gowns, but her sister and successor in office, May Gray, acquired and retained a hold over his affections, to which he has borne grateful testimony. To her training is attributed the early and remarkable knowledge of the scriptures, especially of the Psalms, which he possessed. He was, according to her later testimony, peculiarly inquisitive and puzzling about religion. Of the sense of solitude, induced by his earliest impressions, he characteristically makes a boast. My daughter, my wife, my half-sister, my mother, my sister's mother, my natural daughter, and myself are or were all only children. But the fiercest animals have the fewest numbers in their litters, as lions, tigers, etc. To this practical orphanhood and inheritance of feverish passion, there was added another, and to him a heavy and lifelong burden. A physical defect in a healthy nature may either pass without notice or be turned to a high purpose. No line of his work reveals the fact that Sir Walter Scott was lame. The infirmity failed to cast even a passing shade over that serene power. Milton's blindness is the occasion of the noblest prose and verse of resignation in the language. But to understand Pope, we must remember that he was a cripple, and Byron never allows us to forget, because he himself never forgot it. Accounts differ as to the extent and origin of his deformity, and the doubts on the matter are not removed by the inconsistent accounts of the indelicate post-mortem examination made by Mr. Trelawney at Mesolonghi. It is certain that one of the poet's feet was either at birth or at a very early period, so seriously clubbed or twisted as to affect his gait and to a considerable extent his habits. It also appears that the surgical means boots, bandages, etc. adopted to straighten the limb only aggravated the evil. His sensitiveness on this subject was early awakened by careless or unfeeling references. What a pretty boy Byron is, said a friend of his nurse. What a pity he has such a leg. On which the child, with flashing eyes, cutting at her with a baby's whip, cried out, didn't speak of it. His mother herself, in her violent fits, when the boy ran round the room laughing at her attempts to catch him, he used to say he was a little dog, as bad as his father, and to call him a lame brat an incident, which notoriously suggested the opening scene of the deformed transformed. In the height of his popularity, he fancied that the beggars and street sweepers in London were mocking him. He satirized and discouraged dancing, he preferred riding and swimming to other exercises because they concealed his weakness and on his deathbed asked to be blistered in such a way that he might not be called on to expose it. The Countess Kiccioli, Lady Blessington, and others assure us that in society few would have observed the defect if he had not referred to it, but it was never far from the mind and therefore never far from the mouth of the least reticent of men. In 1792, he was sent to a rudimentary day school of girls and boys, taught by a Mr. Bowers, where he seems to have learned nothing save to repeat monosyllables by rote. He next passed through the hands of a devout and clever clergyman named Ross, under whom, according to his own account, he made astonishing progress, being initiated into the study of Roman history and taking special delight in the Battle of Regillus. Long afterwards, when standing on the heights of Tusculum and looking down on the little round lake, he remembered his young enthusiasm and his old instructor. He next came under the charge of a tutor called Patterson, whom he describes as a very serious, saturnine, but kind young man. He was the son of my shoemaker, but a good scholar. With him I began Latin and continued till I went to the grammar school where I threaded all the classes to the fourth while I was recalled to England by the demise of my uncle. 
of Byron's early school days, there is little further record. We learn from scattered hints that he was backward in technical scholarship and low in his class, in which he seems to have had no ambition to stand high, but they eagerly took to history and romance, especially luxuriating in the Arabian Nights. He was an indifferent penman and always disliked mathematics, but was noted by masters and mates as of quick temper, eager for adventures, prone to sports, always more ready to give a blow than to take one, affectionate, though resentful. When his cousin was killed at Corsica in 1794, he became the next heir to the title. In 1797, a friend, meaning to compliment the boy, said, we shall have the pleasure some day of reading your speeches in the House of Commons, he, with precocious consciousness, replied, I hope not. If you read any speeches of mine, it will be in the House of Lords. Similarly, when, in the course of the following year, the fierce old man at Neustad died, and the young lord's name was called at school with Dominus prefixed to it, his emotion was so great that he was unable to answer, and burst into tears. Belonging to this period is the somewhat shadowy record of a childish passion for a distant cousin slightly his senior, Mary Duff, with whom he claims to have fallen in love in his ninth year. We have a quaint picture of the pair sitting on the grass together, the girl's younger sister beside them playing with a doll. A German critic gravely remarks, this strange phenomenon places him beside Dante. Byron himself, dilating on the strength of his attachment, tells us that he used to coax a maid to write letters for him and that when he was 16, on being informed by his mother of Mary's marriage, he nearly fell into convulsions. But in the history of the Catholics of poets, it is difficult to distinguish between the imaginative afterthought and the reality. This equally applies to other recollections of later years. More remarks dash that the charm of scenery, which derives its chief power from fancy and association, should be felt at an age when fancy is yet hardly awake and associations are but few, can with difficulty he conceived. But between the ages of eight and ten, an appreciation of external beauty is sufficiently common. No one doubts the accuracy of Wordsworth's account in the prelude of his early half-sensuous delight in Melvin Glory. It is impossible to define the influence of nature either on nations or individuals, or to say beforehand what selection from his varied surroundings a poet will for artistic purposes elect to make. Shakespeare rests in meadows and glades, and leaves to Milton Tenerife and Atlas. Burns, who lived for a considerable part of his life in daily view of the hills of Erin, never alludes to them. But, in this respect like Shelley, Byron was inspired by a passion for the high places of the earth. Their shadow is on half his verse. The loftiest peaks most wrapped in clouds and snow perpetually remind him of one of his constantly recurring refrains. He who surpasses or subdues mankind must look down on the hate of those below. In the course of 1790, after an attack of scarlet fever at Aberdeen, he was taken by his mother to Ballader and on his recovery spent much of his time in rambling about the country. From this period, he says, I date my love of mountainous countries. I can never forget the effect, years afterwards, in England, of the only thing I had long seen, even in miniature, of a mountain in the Malvern Hills. After I returned to Cheltenham, I used to watch them every afternoon at sunset with a sensation which I cannot describe. Elsewhere, in the island he returns, amid allusions to the Alps and Apennines, to the friends of his youth. The infant rapture still survived the boy, and Lot Nagir with Ida looked over Troy, mixed Celtic memories with the Phrygian mount, and Highland lens with Castley's clear fount. The poet, owing to his physical defect, was not a great climber, and we are informed, 
on the authority of his nurse, that he never even scaled the easily attainable summit of the steep frowning hill of which he has made such effective use. But the impression of it from a distance was nonetheless genuine. In the midst of a generous address, in Don Juan, to Geoffrey, he again refers to the same associations with the country of his early training. But I am half a Scot by birth, and bred a whole one, and my heart flies to my head as old Lang Syne brings Scotland, one and all Scotch plaids, Scotch snoods, the blue hills and clear streams, the Dee, the Don, Balgunis Briggs Black, while all my boy feelings, all my gentler dreams of why then dreamt, clothed in their own pall, like Banquo's offspring. Byron's allusions to Scotland are variable and inconsistent. His satire on our reviewers was sharpened by the show of national as well as personal antipathy, and when, about the time of its production, a young lady remarked that he had a little of the northern manner of speech, he burst out, good God. I hope not. I would rather the whole DD country was sunk in the sea. I the Scotch accent. But, in the passage from which we have quoted, the swirl of feeling on the other side continues. I rail that Scots to show my wrath and wit, which must be on with sensitive and surly. Yet tis in vain such sallies to permit, they cannot quench young feelings, fresh and early. I scotched, not killed, the Scotchman in my blood, and love the land of mountain in a flood. This suggests a few words on a question of more than local interest. Byron's most careful biographer has said of him, although on his first expedition to Greece he was dressed in the tartan of the Gordon clan, yet the whole bent of his mind and the character of his poetry are anything but Scottish. Scottish nationality is tainted with narrow and provincial elements. Byron's poetic character on the other hand, is universal and cosmopolitan. He had no attachment to localities and never devoted himself to the study of the history of Scotland and its romantic legends. Somewhat similarly, Thomas Campbell remarks of Burns, he was the most unscotsmanlike of Scotchmen, having no caution. Rough national verdicts are apt to be superficial. Mr. Leslie Stephen, in a review of Hawthorne, has commented on the extent to which the nobler qualities and conquering energy of the English character are hidden, not only from foreigners, but from ourselves, by the detestable lay figure of John Bull. In like manner, the obtrusive type of the canny Scot is apt to make critics forget the hot heart that has marked the early annals of the country, from the Hebrides to the borders, with so much violence, and at the same time has been the source of so much strong feeling and persistent purpose. Of late years, the struggle for existence, the temptations of a too ambitious and overactive people in the race for wealth, and the benumbing effect of the constant profession of beliefs that have ceased to be sincere, have for the most part stifled the fervid fire in calculating prudence. These qualities have been adequately combined in Scott alone, the one massive and complete literary type of his race. Burns, to his ruin, had only the fire, the same is true of Byron, whose genius, in some respects less genuine, was indefinitely and inevitably wider. His intensely susceptible nature took a dye from every scene, city, and society through which he passed, but to the last he bore with him the marks of a descendant of the Sea Kings and of the Mad Gordons in whose domains he had first learned to listen to the sound of the two mighty voices that haunted and inspired him through life. In the autumn of 1798, the family, i.e. his mother who had sold the whole of her household furniture for 75 L with himself and a maid, set south. The poet's only recorded impression of the journey is a gleam of Loch Laven, to which he refers in one of his latest letters. He never revisited the land of his childhood. Our next glimpse of him is on his passing the toll bar of Newstead. Mrs. Byron asked the old woman who kept it, 
who is the next heir? And on her answer they say it is a little boy who lives at Aberdeen, this is he, bless him, exclaimed the nurse. Returned to the ancestral abbey, and finding it half ruined and desolate, they migrated for a time to the neighboring Nottingham. Here the child's first experience was another course of surgical torture. He was placed under the charge of a quack named Lavender who rubbed his foot in oil and screwed it about in wooden machines. This useless treatment is associated with two characteristic anecdotes. One relates to the endurance which Byron, on every occasion of mere physical trial, was capable of displaying. Mr. Rogers, a private tutor, with whom he was reading passages of Virgil and Cicero, remarked, It makes me uncomfortable, my lord, to see you sitting them in such pain as I know you must be suffering. Never mind, Mr. Rogers, said the child, you shall not see any signs of it in me. The other illustrates his precocious delight in detecting imposture. Having scribbled on a piece of paper several lines of mere gibberish, he brought them to Lavender and gravely asked what language it was, and on receiving the answer it is Italian, he broke into an exultant laugh at the expense of his tormentor. Another story survives of his vindictive spirit giving birth to his first rhymes. A meddling old lady who used to visit his mother and was possessed of a curious belief in a future transmigration to our satellite the bleakness of whose scenery she had not realized having given him some cause of offense, he stormed out to his nurse that he could not bear the sight of the witch and vented his wrath in the quatrain. In Nottingham County there lives, at Swan Green, as cursed an old lady as ever was seen, and when she does die, which I hope will be soon, she firmly believes she will go to the moon. The poet himself dates his first dash into poetry a year later, 1800, from his juvenile passion for his cousin Margaret Parker, whose subsequent death from an injury caused by a fall he afterwards deplored in a forgotten elegy. I do not recollect, he writes through the transfiguring mists of memory, anything equal to the transparent beauty of my cousin or to the sweetness of her temper during the short period of our intimacy. She looked as if she had been made out of a rainbow all beauty and peace. My passion had the usual effects upon me. I could not sleep. I could not eat. I could not rest. It was the texture of my life to think of the time that must elapse before we could meet again. But I was a fool then and not much wiser now. Sick Transit Secunda The departure at a somewhat earlier date of May Gray for her native country gave rise to evidence of another kind of affection. On her leaving he presented her with his first watch and a miniature by Kay of Edinburgh representing him with a bow and arrow in his hand and a profusion of hair over his shoulders. He continued to correspond with her at intervals. Byron was always beloved by his servants. This nurse afterwards married well and during her last illness in 1827 communicated to her attendant, Dr. Ewing of Aberdeen, recollections of the poet from which his biographers have drawn. In the summer of 1799, he was sent to London, entrusted to the medical care of Dr. Bailey, brother of Joanna, the dramatist, and placed in a boarding school at Dulwich under the charge of Dr. Glenny. The physician advised a moderation in athletic sports, which the patient in his hours of liberty was constantly apt to exceed. The teacher who continued to cherish an affectionate remembrance of his pupil, even when he was told on a visit to Geneva in 1817 that He ought to have made a better boy of him testifies to the alacrity with which he entered on his tasks, his playful good humor with his comrades, his reading and history beyond his age, and his intimate acquaintance with the scriptures. In my study, he states, he found many books open to him, among others, a set of our poets from Chaucer to Churchill, which I am almost tempted to say he had more than once perused from beginning to end. 
One of the books referred to as the narrative of the shipwreck of the Juno, which contains, almost word for word, the account of the two fathers in Don Juan. Meanwhile, Mrs. Byron, whose reduced income had been opportunely augmented by a grant of a 300 L. Annuity from the civil list, after revisiting Newstead, followed her son to London and took up her residence in a house in Sloan Terrace. She was in the habit of having him with her there from Saturday to Monday, kept him from school for weeks, introduced him to idle company, and in other ways was continually hampering his progress. Byron on his accession to the peerage having become a ward in chancery was handed over by the court to the guardianship of Lord Carlisle, nephew of the Admiral and son of the grand aunt of the poet. Like his mother, this Earl aspired to be a poet and his tragedy, The Father's Revenge, received some commendation from Dr. Johnson, but his relations with his illustrious kinsmen were from the first unsatisfactory. In answer to Dr. Glenny's appeal, he exerted his authority against the interruptions to his ward's education, but the attempt to mend matters led to such outrageous exhibitions of temper that he said to the master, I can have nothing more to do with Mrs. Byron, you must now manage her as you can. Finally, after two years of work, which she had done her best to mar, she herself requested his guardian to have her son removed to a public school, and accordingly he went to Harrow, where he remained till the autumn of 1805. The first vacation, in the summer of 1801, is marked by his visit to Cheltenham, where his mother, from whom he inherited a fair amount of Scotch superstition, consulted a fortune teller, who said he would be twice married, the second time to a foreigner. Harrow was then under the management of Dr. Joseph Drury, one of the most estimable of its distinguished headmasters. His account of the first impressions produced by his pupil and his judicious manner of handling a sensitive nature cannot with advantage be condensed. Mr. Hansen, he writes, Lord Byron's solicitor, consigned him to my care at the age of thirteen and a half with remarks that his education had been neglected, that he was ill-prepared for a public school, but that he thought there was a cleverness about him. After his departure, I took my young disciple into my study and endeavored to bring him forward by inquiries as to his former amusements, employments, and associates, but with little or no effect, and I soon found that a wild mountain cult had been submitted to my management but there was mind in his eye. In the first place, it was necessary to attach him to an elder boy, but the information he received gave him no pleasure when he heard of the advances of some much younger than himself. This I discovered and assured him that he should not be placed till by diligence he might rank with those of his own age. His manner and temper soon convinced me that he might be led by a silken string to a point rather than a cable, on that principle I acted. After a time, Dr. Drury tells us that he waited on Lord Carlyle, who wished to give some information about his ward's property and to inquire respecting his abilities, and continues, on the former circumstance I made no remark, as to the latter I replied, he has talents, my lord, which will add luster to his rank. Indeed, said his lordship, with a degree of surprise that, according to my feeling, did not express in it all the satisfaction I expected. With, perhaps, unconscious humor on the part of the writer, we are left in doubt as to whether the indifference proceeded from the jealousy that clings to poet Astor's, from incredulity, or a feeling that no talent could have luster to rank. In 1804, Byron refers to the antipathy his mother had to his guardian, Later, he expresses gratitude for some unknown service in recognition of which the second edition of the Hours of Idleness was dedicated by his obliged ward and affectionate kinsman to Lord Carlyle. The tribute being coldly received led to fresh estrangement and when Byron, on his coming of age, wrote to remind the Earl of the fact in expectation of being introduced to the House of Peers, he had for answer a mere formal statement of its rules. 
This rebuff affected him as Addison's praise of Tickle affected Pope, and the following lines were published in the March of the same year. Lords too are bards. Such things at times befall, and tis some praise and peers to write at all. Yet did or taste or reason sway the times, ah, who would take their titles with their rhymes. Ruscommon, Sheffield, with your spirits fled, no future laurels deck a noble head, no muse will cheer with renovating smile the paralytic puling of Carlyle. In prose he adds, if, before I escape from my teens, I said anything in favor of his lordship's paper books, it was in the way of dutiful dedication, and more from the advice of others than my own judgment, and I seized the first opportunity of pronouncing my sincere recantation. As was frequently the case with him, he recanted again. In a letter of 1814 he expressed to Rogers his regret for his sarcasms, and in his reference to the death of the Honorable Frederick Howard in the third canto of Child Herald, he tried to make amends in the lines. Yet why would select from that proud throng, partly because they blend me with his line, and partly that I did his sire some wrong? This is all of any interest we know regarding the fitful connection of the guardian and ward. Towards Dr. Drury, the poet continued through life to cherish sentiments of gratitude and always spoke of him with veneration. He was, he says, the best, the kindest, and yet strict too, friend I ever had, and I look on him still as a father whose warnings I have remembered but too well, though too late, when I have erred, and whose counsel I have but followed when I have done well or wisely. Great educational institutions must consult the greatest good of the greatest number of commonplace minds by regulations against which genius is apt to kick, and Byron, who is by nature and lack of discipline peculiarly ill-fitted to conform to routine, confesses that till the last year and a half he hated Harrow. He never took kindly to the studies of the place and was at no time an accurate scholar. In the bards and reviewers, and elsewhere, he evinces considerable familiarity with the leading authors of antiquity, but it is doubtful whether he was able to read any of the more difficult of them in the original. His translations are generally commonplace, and from the marks on his books he must have often failed to trust his memory for the meanings of the most ordinary Greek words. To the well-known passage in Child Herald on Soract and the Latian Echoes, he appends a prose comment which preserves its interest as hearing on recent educational controversies, I wish to express that we become tired of the task before we can comprehend the beauty that we learn by rote, before we get by heart that the freshness is worn away and the future pleasure and advantage deadened and destroyed. At an age when we can neither feel nor understand the power of composition, which it requires an acquaintance with life, as well as Latin and Greek, to relish or to reason upon. In some parts of the continent young persons are taught from common authors and do not read the best classics till their maturity. Comparatively slight stress was then laid on modern languages. Byron learned to read French with fluency, as he certainly made himself familiar with the great works of the 18th century, but he spoke it with so little ease or accuracy that the fact was always a stumbling block to his meaning Frenchmen abroad. Of German he had a mere smattering. Italian was the only language, besides his own, of which he was ever a master. But the extent and variety of his general reading was remarkable. His list of books, drawn up in 1807, includes more history and biography than most men of education read during a long life, a fair load of philosophy, the poets and mass, among orators, Demosthenes, Cicero, and parliamentary debates from the revolution to the year 1742, pretty copious divinity, including Blair, Tillotson, Hooker, with the characteristic edition dash all very tiresome. I abhor books of religion, 
people I reverence and love my God without the blasphemous notions of sectaries. Lastly, under the head of miscellanies we have Spectator, Rambler, World, etc., and C, among novels, the works of Cervantes, Fielding, Smollett, Richardson, Mackenzie, Stern, Rabelais, and Rousseau. He recommends Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy as the best storehouse for second-hand quotations, as Stern and others have found it, and tells us that the great part of the books named were perused before the age of 15. Making allowance for the fact that most of the poet's autobiographic sketches are emphatically dieting you and you height, we can believe that he was an omnivorous reader dash I read eating, read in bed, read when no one else reads, and, having a memory only less retentive than Macaulay's, acquired so much general information as to be suspected of picking it up from reviews. He himself declares that he never read a review till he was 18 years old when, he himself wrote one, utterly worthless, on Wordsworth. At Harrow, Byron proved himself capable of violent fits of work, but a few continuous treacheries. He would turn out an unusual number of hexameters, and again lapse into as much idleness as the teachers would tolerate. His forte was in declamation, his attitude in delivery, and power of extemporizing surprised even critical listeners into unguarded praise. My qualities, he says, were much more oratorical and martial than poetical. No one had the least notion that I should subside into poesy. Unpopular at first, he began to like school when he had fought his way to be a champion, and from his energy in sports more than from the impression produced by his talents had come to be recognized as a leader among his fellows. Unfortunately, towards the close of his course, in 1805, the headship of Harrow changed hands. Dr. Drury retired, and was succeeded by Dr. Butler. This event suggested the line's beginning. Where are those honors, Ida, once your own, when Probus filled your magisterial throne? The appointment was generally unpopular among the boys, whose sympathies were enlisted in favor of Mark Drury, brother of their former master, and Dr. Butler seems for a time to have had considerable difficulty in maintaining discipline. Byron, always famous for rowing, was a ringleader of the rebellious party and compared himself to Trillius. On one occasion, he tore down the window gratings in a room of the schoolhouse with the remark that they darkened the hall. On another, he is reported to have refused a dinner invitation from the master with the impertinent remark that he would never think of asking him in return to dine at Newstead. On the other hand, he seems to have set limits to the mutiny and prevented some of the boys from setting their desks on fire by pointing to their father's names carved on them. Byron afterwards expressed regret for his rudeness, but Butler remains in his verse as pomposus of narrow brain, yet of a narrower soul. Of the poet's free hours, during the last years of his residence which he refers to as among the happiest of his life, Many were spent in solitary musing by an elm tree, near a tomb to which his name has been given a spot commanding a far view of London, of Windsor bosomed high in tufted trees, and of the green fields that stretch between, covered in spring with the white and red snow of apple blossom. The others were devoted to the society of his chosen comrades. Byron, if not one of the safest, was one of the warmest of friends, and he plucked the more eagerly at the choicest fruit of English public school and college life from the feeling he so pathetically expresses. Is there no cause beyond the common claim endeared to all in childhood's very name? Ah, sure some stronger impulse vibrates here, which whispers friendship will be doubly dear to one who thus for kindred hearts must roam and seek abroad the love denied at home. Those hearts, dear Ida, have I found in thee a home, a world, a paradise to me. Of his Harrow intimates, the most prominent were the Duke of Dorset, the poet's favorite fag, Lord Clare, the likest of the childish recollections, 
Lord Delaware, the Euryalus, John Wingfield, Alonso, who died at Coimbra, 1811, Cecil Tattersall, Davis, Edward Noel Long, Clan, Wildman, afterwards proprietor of Newstead, and Sir Robert Peel. Of the last, his form fellow and most famous of his mates, the story is told of his being unmercifully beaten for offering resistance to his fag master and Byron rushing up to intercede with an offer to take half the blows. Peel was an exact contemporary, having been born in the same year, 1788. It has been remarked that most of the poet's associates were his juniors and, less fairly, that he liked to regard them as his satellites. But even at Dulwich his ostentation of rank had provoked for him the nickname of the Old English Baron. To Wildman, who, as a senior, had a right of inflicting chastisement for offenses, he said, I find you have got Delaware on your list, pray don't lick him. Why not? was the reply. Why, I don't know, except that he is a brother peer. Again, he interfered with a more effectual arm of physical force to rescue a junior prodigy lame like himself and otherwise much weaker from the ill treatment of some hulking tyrant. Harness, he said, if anyone bullies you, tell me, and I'll thrash him if I can, and he kept his word. Harness became an accomplished clergyman and minor poet and has left some pleasing reminiscences of his former patron. The prodigy of the school, George Sinclair, was in the habit of writing the poet's exercises and getting his battles fought for him in return. His bosom friend was Lord Clare. To him his confidences were most freely given and his most affectionate verses addressed. In the characteristic stanzas entitled Lamatai Eslam or Sans Ales, we feel as if between them the qualifying phrase might have been omitted, for their letters, carefully preserved on either side, are a record of the jealous complaints and the reconciliations of lovers. In 1821 Byron writes, I never hear the name Claire without a beating of the heart even now and I write it with the feelings of 180,345 ad infinitum. At the same day he says of an accidental meeting, it annihilated for a moment all the years between the present time and the days of Harrow. It was a new and inexplicable feeling, like a rising from the grave to me. Claire too was much agitated more in appearance than I was myself for I could feel his heart beat to his fingers ends, unless, Indeed, it was the pulse of my own which made me think so. We were but five minutes together on the public road, but I hardly recollect an hour of my existence that could be weighed against them. They were all that brothers should be but the name, and it is interesting to trace this relationship between the greatest genius of the new time and the son of the statesman who, in the preceding age, stands out serene and strong amid the swarm of turbulent rioters and ranting orators by whom he was surrounded and reviled. Before leaving Harrow the poet had passed through the experience of a passion of another kind with a result that unhappily colored his life. Accounts differ as to his first meeting with Marianne Chaworth, the heiress of the family whose estates adjoined his own, and daughter of the race that had held with his such varied relations. In one of his letters, Hope dates the introduction previous to his trip to Cheltenham, but it seems not to have ripened into intimacy till a later period. Byron, who had, in the autumn of 1802, visited his mother at Bath, joined in a masquerade there and attracted attention by the liveliness of his manners. In the following year, Mrs. Byron again settled at Nottingham and in the course of a second and longer visit to her, he frequently passed the night at the Abbey of which Lord Grey de Ruthen was then a temporary tenant. This was the occasion of his renewing his acquaintance with the Chalworths who invited him to their seat at Annesley. He used at first to return every evening to Newstead, giving the excuse that the family pictures would come down and take revenge on him for his granduncle's deed, a fancy repeated in the Siege of Corinth. 
Latterly, he consented to stay at Annesley, which thus became his headquarters during the remainder of the holidays of 1803. The rest of the six weeks were mainly consumed in an excursion to Matlock and Castleton in the same companionship. This short period, with the exception of prologue and epilogue, embraced the whole story of his first real love. Byron was on this occasion in earnest. He wished to marry Miss Chaworth, an event which, he says, would have joined broad lands, healed an old feud, and satisfied at least one heart. The intensity of his passion is suggestively brought before us in an account of his crossing the sticks of the Peak Cavern, along with the lady and the Sharon of the boat. In the same passage he informs us that he had never told his love, but that she had discovered it is obvious that she never returned it. We have another vivid picture of his irritation when she was waltzing in his presence at Matlock, then an account of their riding together in the country on their return to the family residence, again, of his bending over the piano as she was playing the Welsh air of Marianne, and lastly, of his overhearing her heartless speech to her maid, which first opened his eyes to the real state of affairs dash, do you think I could care for that lame boy? Upon which he rushed out of the house and ran, like a hunted creature, to Newstead. Thence he shortly returned from the rougher school of life to his haunts and tasks at Harrow. A year later the pair again met to take farewell. On the hill of Annesley an incident he has commemorated in two short stanzas that have the sound of a wind moaning over a moor. I suppose, he said, the next time I see you, you will be Mrs. Chaworth? I hope so, she replied, her betrothed, Mr. Musters, had agreed to assume her family name. The announcement of her marriage, which took place in August 1805, was made to him by his mother with the remark, I have some news for you. Take out your handkerchief, you will require it. On hearing what she had to say, with forced calm he turned the conversation to other subjects, but he was long haunted by a loss which he has made the theme of many of his verses. In 1807 he sent to the lady herself the lines beginning, Oh, had my fate been joined with thine. In the following year he accepted an invitation to die at Annesley and was visibly affected by the sight of the infant daughter of Mrs. Chaworth, to whom he addressed a touching congratulation. Shortly afterwards, when about to leave England for the first time, he finally addressed her in the stanzas. Tis done, and shivering in the gale, the bark unfurls her snowy sail. Some years later, having an opportunity of revisiting the family of his successful rival, Mrs. Lee dissuaded him. Don't go, she said, for if you do you will certainly fall in love again, and there will be a scene. The romance of the story culminates in the famous dream, a poem of unequal merit, but containing passages of real pathos, written in the year 1816 at Diodati, as we are told, amid a flood of tears. Miss Chaworth's attractions, beyond those of personal beauty, seem to have been mainly due a common occurrence to the poet's imagination. A young lady, two years his senior, of a lively and volatile temper, she enjoyed the stolen interviews at the gate between the grounds and laughed at the ardent letters passed through a confidant of the still awkward youth whom she regarded as a boy. She had no intuition to divine the presence or appreciate the worship of one of the future masterminds of England, nor any ambition to ally herself with the wild race of Newstead and preferred her hale, commonplace, fox-hunting squire. She was the beau ideal, says Byron, in his first accurate prose account of the affair, written in 1823, a few days before his departure for Greece, of all that my youthful fancy could paint a beautiful and I have taken all my fables about the celestial nature of women from the perfection my imagination created in her. I say created, for I found her, like the rest of the sex, anything but angelic. Mrs. Musters, 
her husband reasserted his right to his own name and in the long run reason to regret her choice. The ill assorted pair, after some unhappy years, resolved on separation and falling into bad health and worse spirits, the bright morning star of Annesley passed under a cloud of mental darkness. She died in 1832, a fright caused by a nodding in riot. On the decease of Musters, in 1850, every relic of her ancient family was sold by auction and scattered to the winds.